Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and we are wrapping up Women in Horror Month with a very special guest this week, the one and only Amanda Wiss. Amanda, thank you so much for being here today uh, chatting with me. I, I'm so excited to dive into your career and talk about some of the fun stuff you have going on right now, too. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really nice. And it's nice to get to chat with you again. No, absolutely. I know we've gotten to do a few panels uh, at Flashback back in Chicago, um, but there's usually like a few people up on stage for those. So I'm glad we're getting a little one on one time this week. Me too. Me too. Yeah, I never quite get very many words in on those panels. <laughs> <laughs> it can I'm, be tough. I'm more of an observer like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> it can be tough. I always try to make sure like I'm asking everybody questions because I know sometimes, you know, I've seen panels where like one or two of the guests get favored and like you have two or three people kind of just sitting there. Yes. So I always try to keep at least evenly, you know, evenly conversated no, if, that, if, if that's such a I, thing. I think with the night nightmare people, because we've all known each other so long and we're really like a dysfunctional group of siblings, we answer for each other. And so I always think it's funny because if I even hesitate, somebody in our in our family will answer my question, which always, which it's now it's like a joke. And we're all just like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, today it's all about you. Um, and I was doing some <laughs> research and, you know, you mentioned obviously growing up here in California. Um, was there a certain point when you realized that you wanted to start acting? Cause I know you started acting really young too. I did. I, yeah, I started when I was 11. I think I kind of always knew it's what I wanted. I mean, when I was really young, our next door neighbors had a, a backyard that had this beautiful porch that came off the backyard and it was raised. And from a, as early as I can remember, I would just go over to their, their house and I would make all the neighborhood kids do plays on this stage. It was a really good stage. And then I went through a phase where I was going to be a lawyer. So I was going to go to USC and I was going to become a lawyer. And then when I, I did my first play at 11. I went, you know what? I'm going to do this and then I'll play a lawyer. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to do. And so I just got the bug. I did um, The Innocence by William Inge. And it was, you know, a really, it's a beautifully written, really creepy play. And um, and I just loved it. And I, I loved that how hard I had to work. And I loved the feeling, the energy from the audience. And I think so. I, I got the bug right. You know, it, it sucked me in <laughs> right away. Well, you mentioned The Innocence, which um, is one of my favorite movies of all time, too. Um, and so you played Flora in that. Is that correct? I did. Oh, my goodness. How was that? Because I, I love the ambiguity of the original. I love the turn of the screw, the original book. How was that? Because like there is she's such a precocious character in that you know there's innocence the things that are very innocent about her yet it almost feels like at certain times she's very much one step ahead of like miss gibbons i think you're in perfectly accurate there's something about her that is well the whole play everybody in that play there was i, I always i mean i haven't read this in, in a long time or seen the movie in a long time but I remember the adults around me when we were doing it, discussing that they felt almost like everybody was not quite what they seem in, in some ways, or that was their take on it. Um, my, my take on it was just, you know, I thought that I just made her my friend. Do you know what I mean? Because you can't judge the character that you're playing. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that she's creepy. You know, watching her, you know, I mean, I, you can't play creepy as an actor, but don't you think Flora was creepy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, in some ways, I must find her creepier than Miles because she's a little bit younger. So she shouldn't be as ahead of things as she is, yeah. um, which I is so interesting a, to me. Like, like a sociopath or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, and for anybody listening, uh, if you've never seen the movie, I do recommend it. Criterion has a beautiful Blu-ray of it out. Um, and I watch it quite a bit uh, it, ho during the Halloween season. But yeah, I think it's really interesting. And you were also in The Bad Seed too, weren't you? Yes, I played Rhoda. The, um, the following year, I played Rhoda. And I I feel like I have a natural proclivity to step inside these amoral people. I don't know why I lead a very moral life, but 
I love just stripping down to that. And I loved it even as a kid. It was really fun to find a way to relate to that character because she's a, she's, you know, another, I mean, she's definitely a sociopath or, you know, homicidal psychotic or something. <laughs> I'm not even sure. No, that's really, that's really interesting. Cause like you, you know, we, we've known each other for a little bit now and you're so nice. And like you <laughs> kind of came up playing these very complicated uh, characters, which I think is very interesting. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's, it's, it's a funny, funny sort of backstory to how you got started. Um, because you, you know, you're so like, you're so personable and so warm and everything. And I'm like, it just seems like such a fun juxtaposition. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I hope, I hope so. Um, but yeah, you know what? And in fact, even early on, I did a, a real a big TV movie. In fact, at the time, it was like the highest rated TV movie. It was, I was, it was called My Mother's Secret Life, and it was with Lonnie Anderson so at the height of her spectacular fame. And like even that, you know, I, I play like a really sweet Midwestern girl, but I'm just a mess. Like I, she's, I'm not doing it right. I'm just like not living <laughs> my best life. And I, I just, I don't know why. I think. Maybe because it's the way to like really go, because I think we all sometimes at night when the room is dark and you start to fall asleep and your mind gets can get chaotic sometimes and you can go to dark places. It's kind of a fun way to unleash all that, to play those characters. And because I think we all have those thoughts, people can relate to them too. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I, and I think you're right on with that. You know, I think there's a, there's a part of all of us that sort of ha has a little bit of that inside us. And I think, and I think acting gives you a really great way to sort of explore that, you know, what you've been able to do, you know, gosh, for, for decades now, which is pretty amazing because, you know, sometimes when you start off as a kid, you don't kind of, a lot of folks have difficulty sort of navigating those waters, you know, throughout their career, but you've, you know, you're still here, you're still creating. And I think that's pretty awesome. Thank you. Well, you know what? I've had some lean years, <laughs> to be honest, where people were like, you're still acting. And I'm like, yes, as tears stroll down my face. But overall, I've been able to maneuver from, you know, the young girl that did a million California girl commercials which I did if they needed somebody tan with long blonde hair who could roller skate. I was doing those <laughs> commercials. I was I was such a cliche, and um and then into you know the young girl you know the young woman in the eighties movies and then now I I feel like I I think I've always been an attractive character actor. I've never been like the leading lady. Um, you know, the large breasted, beautiful blonde. I've never been that. <laughs> I've, always, I've always been like, if I am the lead, it's a tortured story. And I, otherwise I am often like the moral heart and soul of something, where, even if it, if, even if I'm amoral, because it makes you think. And so I kind of feel like that's also been helpful because as it, character actor, I think I have a lot more options. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's interesting too, because when you were coming up, like you were doing a lot of TV and film, yes. um, which I'm guessing really helped you sort of round out those experiences because you were able to, you know, I, I, I'm not saying anything that most people listening to this don't know, but obviously TV is a little bit structured differently than it is, you know, when you're going into doing features. Did you find like being able to do both very early gave you a really good foothold for like how the business was and, you know, sort of preparing you as you continued to, you know, work, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s and stuff? That's a really interesting question. I, I think it did. I, I mean, I think now things have merged so much. Back then, people didn't do both too much. I mean, you, you could, it was almost like if you were on a soap, you couldn't do nighttime TV. If you were doing TV, you couldn't do movies. If you're doing movies, you'd never want to do TV. And now that's all like a big stew. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know what? I, I mean, I remember early on thinking some of the differences that were really interesting was, you know, obviously TV just moves at such a quick pace. And so I think that really prepared me for doing independent film because, you know, a studio movie moves or, you know, and I think those are even changing slightly. But, you know, you'd go, I 
we shot Silverado for like five months in New Mexico. And I was there for five months and worked 14 days. That would never happen now, you know, right. It's like a slower pace and where TV, you know, you're there, you know, it's a breakneck pace. And so, you know, early on when I did a couple indies and people were like, I can't work like this. And, but they hadn't done television. I don't, you know what I mean? So they were like, I, I need more time. And it's like, dude, there is no more time. <laughs> this, is it. this is what you're doing. You have to do your homework. Like that's the thing, like with TV and especially if you're on a series, you know, your whole life is about, okay, I finished this. Now I've got to memorize the next thing. You have to just, your brain has to stay really facile and, and there isn't a lot of time. So you had, you need to know, know your stuff. And like, I'm always surprised when I show up on a set for an independent film and somebody doesn't know their lines. And to me, I'm like, what were you doing yesterday? I mean, this is the <laughs> most important thing you're going to do today. And there's no time. And now you're messing with my creation because now I don't have a, a partner to play with because you're not present because you don't know your lines. So I, I, I just like, so I think I, because I started so young, like, you know, I'm always on time. I always know my lines. I'm always open to play and I I get real frustrated with people that don't take it that seriously, which isn't very kind. I don't mean it in a judgmental way, but it does frustrate me. No, absolutely. I, I totally get that. And obviously I want to talk about Nightmare because, you know, that became such a watershed moment for the genre, for you um, and, and everything. But before we do that, I really want to talk about Fast Times at Ridgemont High, if we can, um, because I, I'm so it's such an interesting film to be because it became this huge catalyst. It's like a murderer's row of talent involved with that film. It's great. Uh, you're so, like you look at that cast in 1982 and it blows my mind because you, you know, obviously Amy Hackerling kind of like at the beginning of her career, you've got Cameron Crowe who, you know, was really starting to come into his own, you know, as a writer before he was even directing. And then you look at the cast and, you know, and I love that you and Kelly Maroney are both in this. Yes. Um, but you have like Sean Penn and Jennifer Jason Lee and Forrest Whitaker and like, I, how on, like, what was that experience like? Because I just, it, I, I I'm so fascinated. Like every time I watched that movie, I didn't love it as a kid. I think I, it, it just kind of escaped me a little bit, but as yeah. an adult, like I've really fallen in love with it because I realized like just how progressive and how kind of was sort of ahead of its time for teen comedies. It was. And in many ways, it's not even a comedy. I mean, it's dealing with such heavy issues and I yeah. think, that it was marketed as a teen film, but I think it was actually, I mean, nowadays teens, it would be different, but I mean, that they came out in a time when I think people were slightly more sheltered than they are now. But there's two things I was going to say to that, that your, your observation is that that movie, literally every single person in that movie either went on to be a huge movie star and, you know, a character actor like me, or they left the business and are hugely successful in whatever they're doing, like uh, literally to a person. And, 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 you know, and then the people that had one line or no line, you know, you had Nick Cage was, you know, like the guy friend number three, you know what I mean? Like there was like, <laughs> there was like so many people, Anthony Edwards, Eric Stoltz, um, James Remar. Um, I mean, you just go on like, like there was like you, the, the people in the background. Are like, you know, it's yeah. Yeah. I know it's it's funny. It didn't even dawn on me until like last year that Pamela Springsteen was in it. Yeah. Who of course goes on to Sleepaway Camp sequels. But like I was like, wow, there is like every everybody's in this movie and everybody's really done very well for themselves. Well, it's all on Amy Heckerling and who I just idolize. I, she's just fantastic. She's just a beautiful human being, a, a, a fantastic artist and director and creator of things and just really respects the process and likes actors. And like when I auditioned for it, it, you know, I read, I don't know what I read. I might've even just read, I think they were having everybody read, um, Stacy, Jennifer Jason Lee's part. Although I think I'm pretty, she had already been cast, but really it was just an improv with judge Reinhold. And we basically improved the breakup scene. I mean, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've had almost 40 years, so I feel like. <laughs> Wait, does your cave have running water? Um, but, um, and so I was like, it was just, you know, we just sat on the edge of a desk and, you know, kicked our legs like we were, you know, on bleachers and, and broke up. And I think they told me in the room I had the part. And th you know what? That's happened to me twice and never since the 80s. It happened on 
uh, Fast Times, and it happened with um, Nightmare on Elm Street, where Wes told us in the room that we could come play with him. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. I mean, obviously, you know, nobody really knows what a movie is going to become while they're in the middle of it, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure being in this in the middle of Nightmare on Elm Street, you guys had no idea what this movie would ultimately become. But what it's interesting, I know technically, you know, you are Freddie's first on screen victim, but I think more importantly, you are the first person we see like we see Freddie's hand at the beginning of the movie, <clears throat> but it's Tina's face that sort of introduces us into this world. And I think to me, that's even more remarkable than being the victim because you set the tone for what that movie is. And it's your terror and your panic that really brings us into this. And I'm curious, you know, what was, did you feel any of that sort of pressure? Because I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure there's pressure that comes with every role, but like to be sort of the, the tone setter, if you will, for what this movie would ultimately become like, that's pretty cool. Um, and I think that's, you know, I don't think you get enough credit for that because I think, you know, yeah, you're his victim, but you are the introduction into the world of Nightmare on Elm Street. Thank you for saying that. That makes me feel really good. And I appreciate it. And well, you know, the pressure I felt what you know, I, I was so young. I don't think I, I, I was thinking uh, because a, we didn't know it was going to be what it was or that it was going to be a franchise, but I, I did know, cause I'd never done a horror film and I talked to Wes about it and he, he was like, I want this to be as real and raw as possible because he, he wanted to make, he, he was hoping Tina would break people's heart because if, if they liked me or Tina, sorry, if they liked Tina, her death becomes meaningful. And, and it also sets up that nobody's safe that you, I think, cause I think in a lot of horror films, we don't care much about the people being killed. Do you know what I mean? We haven't connected with them for the most part. I mean, sometimes we do, but the, I think he was, a, I think Wes is the first person to do that in a, a like, you know, I guess it's, a slasher film, but it's, it's kind of an elevated slasher film, but it's a slasher film. But, um, but yeah, so I had, a, I felt pressure to really, you know, like the death scene had to be so real and visceral and things like that. So I think more like on the particular things of, I really wanted to connect with Heather and she really wanted to connect with me. And, and I think it was those personal things that we worked on, on, on in the minutia that, I think really helped that. Does that make sense? My no, it, it really does. And I think that's the thing that, you know, maybe that's probably one of the reasons that like I fell in love with Nightmare on Elm Street as a kid is because I believe that Nancy and Tina were friends, you know, like the, cause obviously you guys come together as you're walking into the high school, um, you know, after your nightmare and everything like that. And I, the, just the banter between you guys, plus then, you know, when rock comes up and everything like that, like I really believed that you guys all knew each other, you hung out with each other, that you guys were really in the middle of all of this. And I think well, there's you know a sense for that. We all really liked each other in real life and we're all still friends. And I mean, that's like just great chemistry. And, and it's kind of the same with Fast Times and Better Off Dead. And maybe it was just that era, but those are like, if I didn't go to college, I only went to two years, but if I did, I feel like those people are my college friends and we're still really good friends. And I wanted to say thank you again for saying that about Tina, because often, and I don't take it personally, but sometimes I'm like, cause people are like, you're Freddie's first victim. And it's like, well, there's so much more to it than that. And then I'm like, is that all people think about a movie? You know what I mean? And I'm yeah. like, and so I always go, I was the first person to fight him. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you and, were. And I fought, and she fought really hard. Like it really set up like how brutal it was going to be. You know, it wasn't like he just jumped out and killed me. Like the whole thing. Like for he's trying to kill me for like 14 minutes of the film. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think also what's it, what's what I always really appreciate about Nightmare on Elm Street and a lot of horror movies actually in the 80s is that, you know, these stories were taking on like kids who were in like single parent homes um, and sort of navigating, you know, this transition into adulthood on their own. Yeah, um, because that was something that I had done myself. 
And I think there's something really telling about the scene, you know, when Tina wakes up from her nightmare and Donna comes in and, you know, asks you, you know, what's going on? You got to cut your nails. And it's just it seems like such a throwaway moment. But I think it really sets the tone for the desperation that Tina has because she is dealing with this by herself. Like she can tell her friends about it. But ultimately, you know, this is something she has to do herself. And I just think that there's again, it's like such a a small moment in the movie um, and it happens very early on. But I think it's really telling as to, you know, this Tina's home life, which, again, it doesn't beat us over the head with any kind of like crazy exposition or anything like that. But I just I think it ends up being this really powerful moment where you realize like, oh, this poor girl, like obviously she's just went through something really traumatic, you know, in her nightmare. And her mom's like, just cut your nails. And yeah. you're like, you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And you hear the guy in the other room, like, come back to bed. <laughs> it's just yeah. Like, well, you know what? <laughs> Wes talked about. And I mean, and I was so young. I, I don't remember a lot of, you know, these things. I more in hindsight, you know, in later conversations. But that was at the beginning of um, divorce was becoming much more acceptable in our in our society. And so it, he was really making a commentary on the kind of the first generation of these latchkey kids that um, are either in broken homes or, you know, alcoholic homes, but where they're almost raising each other uh, because the parent, one or more of the parents is absent, absentee. And um, I thought that was, you know, and I think that comes across, I think there's a lot of little subtle story things like that in the movie that gets you on an unconscious level that people can relate to. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you you obviously you also mentioned Better Off Dead, which was a favorite of mine growing up as well. And I, I just have to know how like I know Savage, Savage Steve Holland sort of has this reputation of being sort of this crazy guy. Was he was he like that on screen or, or during <laughs> production? Um, I'm just, you know, because you not only do you get to fight Freddy, but, you you know, you get to break John Cusack's heart and, and everything like that. Like you you get to do some pretty uh, fun stuff in the 80s. <laughs> I did. Oh, my gosh. Um, You know what? Savage Steve is the best. He's so smart and super funny and has literally the biggest heart. He's just uh, this gentle giant. I mean, he's not a big guy, but he's tall. And he's just... He's so funny. Now he does a ton of children's programming on, you know, like Nickelodeon and places like that. And yeah, he was just, he was just so funny and he still is. He just, he's kind of like, he's just nice and he talks really fast and he's, you know, he's, he's, I think he's kind of like a John Cusack's character, I think was based a little bit on him. I, I think that trying to kill himself part, but like, you know, he's a skier and grew up on the East coast and liked a girl named Beth, <laughs> I don't know, just stuff like that. He's, he is the best. And I just, I love working with him and I, I'm so glad that we've stayed friends. He's, he's the best. Well, I always think it's interesting, like based on like my experience with 80 movies, I always thought skiing was going to end up being a bigger part of my life because it seemed like everything like had skiing. Cause it was like, Better Off Dead. And I think that that Better Off Dead sort of set the tone for like ski resort and ski school and all these things. And I really thought skiing was going to be this thing like that everybody does. And, you know, and then I realized like as I got older, I was like, oh, I guess not. Like the movies lied to me, dang it. Um, but I was, I just, I always remember like thinking like the, the most important things with the, like, you know, these big pentultimate moments, like would revolve around skiing somehow <laughs> and they just never did. But I, I, I always, I, I love that role because again, it was one of those, like I saw it a few years after I saw Nightmare on Elm Street and I was like, oh my gosh, it's Tina. Like I would get excited. Cause I remember when you would pop up on different TV shows too. And I'd be like, oh, it's Amanda. Like, cause my middle name is Amanda too. So of course, like oh. between ha- that, I think that was another reason Nightmare was like one of my favorites is because, you know, you have Heather Langenkamp and Amanda Wiss. So it was like my names were covered. So I was like, how could I not love this movie? <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's 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 one of those I, I rewatched Better Off Dead a couple years ago and I, I just loved it way more. Again, I think it's like having that adult perspective, like things that you enjoy as a kid, but you really take to heart in a completely different way as an adult. And, you know, for all the the offbeat zany moments of comedy, like there's a really sweet story in there. And I just think you guys all are fantastic, including Diane Franklin, who is oh, just adorable. She is beyond adorable. I mean, and Curtis Armstrong. I love him so much. Yes. Yes. And it was nice yes. to see him doing something that wasn't booger. Yes, um, you know, because exactly. everybody knows Revenge of the Nerds. But I think there's so much more to Curtis. There is. He's actually he's a 
an amazing, highly trained theater actor, serious actor, like like Robert England from um, Nightmare on Elm Street. They both you know, are known so completely for this one thing, but they're both like classically trained theater actors. And I love that about them. But that's why you love the characters that they made famous because they're actually like really good actors. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. I know we're kind of getting close on time because I know you have you have um, places to be. But I wanted to ask really quick about Silverado because my mom was super obsessed with Silverado when I was a kid. So I watched it quite a bit. Um, and of course, Lawrence Kasdan is, you know, this immense talent who, you know, has been involved with like some really big films over the years. And you get to sort of be in this period piece movie like how amazing was that experience? Because it's so different um, than I think a lot of the films that you were doing at the time. Yeah, it was it was magical. I mean, it was literally magical and everybody on it felt that way. It was it was so beautiful. It, we shot at this place called Cook's Ranch right up right in Santa Fe or on the outskirts of Santa Fe in New Mexico. And it was winter and it was snowy and these cerulean blue skies and the the cast was amazing and we just laughed all the time and you know every at the rap every saturday night there was a motown dance party because that somebody would throw you know in one of their rented places because they'd all had you know the the entire crew pretty much had worked on the big chill and just i remember um brian dennehy took it was jeff fahey me has maybe Kevin Costner, maybe it was a couple other people out to dinner one night. And he said, you guys need to really take this in because this is not what it's like normally making a movie. <laughs> Cause it was, it was that special. It was just special. And, and, you know, and then we, you know, Lawrence made such a beautiful film that I think came out a year too early. I think if it had come out the next year, like with pale rider, I just think that it would have been a much bigger hit than it was. I just think it was ahead of its time. And then yeah. the whole spree of Westerns that came out after that. And, but, um, oh yeah, I love that movie so much. Well, I, my mom rented it like all the time. Like it was like <laughs> at least once a month and I'd be like, Oh, we're renting Silverado again. Okay. <laughs> I was like, all right. Cause you could only rent two at a time at our video store. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, oh my God. You're like, I guess I know your movie. <laughs> I, I get I get my 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 repetitious viewing habits from her, I believe. Um, so I think what's interesting, I wanted to talk about um, the id because we we talked about that a few years ago. And I know that's something that came about with Tommy because, you know, of your involvement with Never Sleep Again. And you guys became great friends because of that, obviously. And I love that. If I'm remembering correctly, I think he wrote it for you or am I, am I remembering that correctly. Yeah, that, so very closely. Uh, he, Tommy actually, he, even though Tommy's a great writer, he did not write that. Um, Sean. Oh, oh okay, my gosh, that's my mind. Sean Stewart. Oh, gosh, thank you. Gosh, forgive me, Sean. Sean Stewart wrote it and then took it to Tommy and Tommy was like, I'll do this if we can get Amanda. And I thought that was pretty awesome. And and you know what? The movie, you know, there's things about it that I wish were, you know, better if it had been a better budget and things like that. But it was such a fun role to play. Like I, it's still, I have to, I think it's probably my, as an adult anyway, my favorite role, just because it was such a, a wonderful experience to go down a rabbit hole and try to find a way to make that insane story have any sense of grounded reality to it no there's a humanity to meredith you know what i mean like she's she's not just a caricature there's something real to her and there's it's it's a layered performance and i think you know i mean i think there's there's some rough edges i mean you know i think there's that happens in any movies but that doesn't mean rough edges can be good because i think that just makes you realize like you know that something is working in a way like i don't know if that even makes sense But I, I I really liked what you did with Meredith in that movie because you if you had played it just a few touches over to the left a little bit, we it would have come off like completely unbelievable. Yes, and and, and there's there's you know I, because I think it's always I wish I could do everything backwards. <laughs> you know, I'm, there's a couple scenes where I'm like, oh well, but um yes, it was it was really fun and and I'm really proud of it. And I wish more people had seen it, but. They didn't. And um, but it's I'm really proud of it. And it was a it was a really exciting, creative experience because we shot that whole film in 14 days. And it was just so much 
chaos. And somehow everybody just was incredibly calm and incredibly focused. And it, it was a really interesting experience to see people come together to try to create something. And, and so I know, I'm, I know, I, I mean, I'm really proud of the character and I was, I was really taken aback. Like when the re- reviewers wrote about it, how so many people picked up on the caretaking aspect of it and were relating to that, like just take the horror out of it. And I, that I didn't expect. And I was, I thought, wow, you know, it meant something to people that are living in a a situation that's incredibly stressful to them. And that made me feel really good about it, that it touched people in a way beyond the horror. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I know you're getting ready to head out to the Women in Horror Film Festival uh, yeah. this week. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's pretty awesome. Because are, are they are they giving you an award, if I'm remembering correctly? They or- are. And I, I am beside myself with like shock and glee and... You know, and I, I am just so honored. I am I am deeply honored by a group of, by all these women who I just, I, I'm just, I'm a girl's girl. And I, I love women in the film industry and the women in horror. And yes, I'm getting the Icon Award, which I don't, I'm like, well, I don't think I'm an icon um, at all. But I am, I will accept it with just such glee and gratitude that anybody anywhere has ever watched my movies and like them. And I'm just so <laughs> grateful that I, that somebody cared. And so, and, and Heather, who's my dear friend in real life from Nightmare on Elm Street is premiering, um, a, a movie, a movie that she wrote and directed there. So I'm excited to get to go and support her with that. And, oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah. And then, um, and then I was going to tell you, I have a really fun supernatural horror thriller coming out March 24th called Hunter's Moon. That's it's Jay Moore and Thomas Jane and me and a couple other people. And it's, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary and it's really good. And there's werewolves in it too, isn't there? There might be. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We need more werewolf werewolf horror movies. So I, I actually, um, yeah, it was, uh, I saw the trailer for it. I want to say maybe last month. So that's really yeah. exciting for you. I know. I, yeah. haven't, I haven't seen it yet. We're doing a screening, I think the middle of March. So I'm, I'm excited to see it. I mean, I've seen little bits like when we went and did the ADR, but I, so I, I, I but I think people are going to like it and, and Jay Moore is just so cool. And Thomas Jane, obviously, and all the, the beautiful girls that play our daughters, um, Katrina Bowden, um, India Nenga. It just, oh my gosh, they're just such talented, beautiful young ladies. Well, that is amazing to hear. So we will definitely keep an eye out for that. I'm I'm excited because, like I said, werewolves, you you. Uh, Thomas Jane, like I'm in, and Katrina Bowden, who I loved in Tucker and Dale. Um, I'm just, I'm always <laughs> glad to see when she pops up in anything too. So. She is fan freaking tastic. She's just, she's so gorgeous and just so on it. And, uh, I mean, she's just, I, I just adore her. I, I, all, all of them, all three of the daughters, they're all just stunning. And, and, oh, and, and, um, Sean Patrick Flannery is in it. And anyway, it's a it's a fun cast and it's a really good story. And I, I like the the director a lot. He's he's a new director and he's Michael Casey. And he wrote Hangman, the movie that Al Pacino did like a couple of years ago. And so it's, he's oh. he's got some good chops, I think. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I know we have to cut short because I know you've got you've got places to be because you are in demand, Miss, Miss Amanda Wiss. <laughs> okay, I need to be which is a, in which demand is though, actually. <laughs> this year. Yes, is let's put it out into the universe. <laughs> yes. But this was it was a real delight, and I'm really glad we got to do this and have a have a fun discussion. Um, so I really do appreciate you joining us for this week's episode. So thank you, Amanda, for taking time because I know you've got a lot going on this week. So I really do appreciate it. I am just thrilled that you wanted to talk with me. I'm a big fan of yours and thank you very much for having me. And you make me feel like a million bucks. So thank you. Well, you are a million bucks. So you (laughs) should feel that way. Um, For those of you listening, thank you so much uh, for supporting Corpse Club. If you want to read, find out more about Corpse Club, you can visit us over at corpseclub.com. For all your news, reviews and interviews, you can head over to dailydead.com. And until next time, everybody stay scary. (laughs) 